Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Rome and how republics die. We have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Edward Watts, author of the new book, Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyranny, available now. Ed holds the Alcaviades Vasiliades Endowed Chair and is Professor of History at the University of California, San Diego, and former director of the UCSD Center for Hellenic Studies. He has a number of previous books covering education in late antique Greece, conflict between pagans and Christians in Alexandria, the final pagan generation in the turmoil of the 4th century, and Hypatia, the famous female philosopher of Alexandria. Mortal Republic traces the end of the Roman Republic from its seeming stability in the 3rd century BC through the turmoil of the Gracchan period and the social and civil wars of the 1st century to the rise of Octavian to the position of Augustus in a clear, readable way that makes it comprehensible to those without a background in the period. So welcome, Ed, and thank you so much for speaking with us today. Oh, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. So just to start off, I was looking at, as I described it, your previous work, and it's generally focused on middle and late antiquity. But it's also clear that you tend to be interested in periods of transition and change from one societal context to another. So what inspired you to write this book in particular? Uh, there's actually a couple of things. One of them is is sort of purely like deep dive scholarly. Um, I'm working on a project that is looking at processes of sort of creation of a sensibility of being Roman between uh-huh. the first century and the project will conclude in the ninth century. And I was reading a lot of second century figures like Appian who deal in Plutarch, who deal with Republican history Mm -hmm. um, and becoming very interested in the way that they're sort of conceiving of this Republican history and Roman Republican sort of contexts as something that they both kind of own and also sort of struggle with. Um, and I was doing this work during the, the sort of period in 2016, um, leading up to the election, uh, of Trump. Mm -hmm. And what I was noticing, um, of course, not expecting that, that Trump would be elected (laughs) was a lot of the sort of processes that these, um, later Greek figures were sort of struggling to understand, uh, started sort of appearing in, in the way the U S political dynamics were sort of unfolding as well. Um, and in particular, this, this sort of, um, tendency among certain leaders of the later Republic to basically obstruct and kind of gum up the functioning of the Republican system, not to sort of generate any kind of consensus or sort of move debate or move policy forward, but simply because they were trying to block the interests of an individual mm. um, whose policies or whose sort of profile they, they disagreed with. And what I was seeing was there was a lot of this going on in 2016. And if Clinton had won, um, that would have been the dominant narrative in U.S. politics as well. Uh, So I I started sort of transitioning to this book um, as a way to sort of use the examples of the Roman past to encourage people to think about the consequences of that kind of behavior in a political system that has institutions designed to promote kind of consensus and compromise. Um, But I think what Rome shows is when those institutions are misused for sort of personal gain, um, they can be used in that way, but it's not what they're intended to do. And there's all sorts of problems for the system if these tools are, are deliberately misused by individuals to promote their own personal agenda instead of the sort of larger good of the society. That's interesting. So you'll be sort of looking at how the understanding of that period uh, of transition changed over the years, you know, from, uh, you know, just shortly after that, that transition from a republic to, you know, hundreds of years later and how, uh, you know, they conceived of what happened then. Uh, yeah, I've, the larger project, um, I think what's particularly interesting is you have these figures in the second century uh, who are Greek, um, Greek speaking from all around the Eastern Mediterranean who basically say that my heritage as a you know Greek speaking native of Alexandria or a Greek speaking native of Chaeronea, um, there's a Greek heritage, but there's also a Roman heritage mm-hmm. and Roman history is my history. And understanding kind of the process by which Roman history became my history is important. Mm. 
Um, and so what that means is these figures who are really Roman in an imperial context, and in particular in the sort of great stability of the Antonine era, they have to deal with the Republican history that you know their ancestors would not have seen as theirs. Right. Uh, but they do see it as theirs. And the exemplary figures of the Republic are figures that they have to sort of engage with because it's part of a tradition that they identify with, but it's not the only tradition they identify with. Um, and so it's a, it's a sort of problematic um, way of conceiving of Republic because for a lot of these figures, the Republic is the precursor to the empire that they belong to and that integrated them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Republic is something that is not, it's not inherently good, but it's also not inherently bad. And the figures who are sort of working in the Republic and sort of helping precipitate the onset of the empire, um, they also are not inherently good or bad. And they're, they're sort of figures you have to struggle with to understand. Um, and the Republican context then becomes something that you really have to think a lot about if you are a sort of writer in the second century, mm. um, because you can't completely embrace it, but there are elements of it that you actually think are quite good and elements of the kind of free operation of the society that you think are good. Um, but not totally good. <laughs> uh, and so that's that's the sort of thing that um, I was sort of trying to work through um, when I decided that this actually is material that, you know, that I think has a, lo- a larger implication um, and possibly is instructive for helping us think about uh, the world that's unfolding around mm-hmm. us. Okay, now it's the, uh, now I just want to talk to you about Plutarch, but okay. <laughs> that's no, that's really interesting, and I like the. I mean, because it does make me think immediately about you know the parallel lives and things, and about this attempt to integrate Roman and Greek history into something coherent. Um, yeah. And because they don't have the same stake, in because when we you know when I think about I do late Republic uh, poetry mostly, but. When I think about late mm-hmm. Republican authors and early imperial authors, um, even up to Lucan or Statius or something, they're dealing with the fall of the Republic very much in a, do we hate the empire or like the empire? Uh, you have to take a position on it. Or wh- are you, you know, is everything the beginning of the end of everything that is good? Or is it the end of everything that was bad and the beginning of all that is good? Or, you know, how do you, and, yeah. and because they're, they're so sort of intensely... Um, almost still fighting those fights, even if they're actually lost or won or whatever. Um, but it's a very <laughs> it's a very different perspective on it. And as you say, for the Greeks, it's not really a matter of, I mean, it is their history, but at the same time, they're not invested in it in the same way of feeling like it, they were on one team or the other somehow. Yeah. Well, I think the, the perfect counterpoint to that Republican and late Republican, early imperial kind of struggle about, well, we've given something up and mm-hmm. we've gotten something. And was the mm-hmm. trade worth it? You know, is the fact that Octavian can now ensure that we won't die and have our property confiscated worth giving up the sort of freedoms that we had in the Republic that actually couldn't make mm-hmm. those guarantees? And what you have, um, I think the, the perfect sort of second century example of the sort of intellectual struggle is right. Appian. Um, Appian is an Alexandrian Greek who ends up working in Rome um, as a sort of well, as a sort of magistrate under Antoninus Pius. And Appian's history is this teleological work that actually gives an account of the the history of the Mediterranean in sort of geographically specific ways that talk about how Rome basically takes those places and Mm -hmm. absorbs them. But then um, when the civil wars start, it becomes an integrative narrative where the, everything is happening throughout. And then the final conclusion of this was the conquest of Egypt, which is his right. integration. And then the history becomes a sort of almost classical history of the mm-hmm. Roman Empire. But the teleology is sort of moving from this disorder of Mediterranean um, disunity into the sort of bringing together of everything into the empire. And the empire is, in a sense, mm-hmm. the end point. It's a positive because of its integrative function. But when you read him for the civil wars, and I think most people just read Appian for the civil wars, they don't <laughs> read the rest of him. Um, he's not hes not positively disposed towards the figures who are causing this. Right. And he doesn't see the civil wars as a good thing. Um, but they are a sort of point in a process that he ultimately does think is right. a good thing. 
Um, and I think that's the, you know, that's the sort of, when you move a hundred years forward um, and you move out of the sort of almost agony of making choices about being free in one sense and being free in another sense, um, what you see is there's a sort of clarity about what the empire actually has brought, but also a feeling about, you know, the Republic was good. There were good things about it. It was um, very positive in some aspects, but in the end, the trade-off was, I think to Appian at least, right. worth it. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mulling over what you said, because that's all very interesting. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm interested in, in what you can gain from taking this longer perspective uh, that you're taking um, into the ninth century is a very long perspective from, from my position. <laughs> but, uh, but that's, yeah. you know, being able to see that sweep of the whole process, and where people put themselves within it, where they feel that they sit inside that process. It's really interesting. It's the sort of thing to get back to the book that um, you can't do you can't do with the, <laughs> right now, right? We're in this moment. I mean, it's a sort of a later question I was going to ask, but it, it makes me think about why we why we have this impulse to look to Rome and Greece, but in particular right now, Rome, um, to try to figure out what's going on right now. And I think part of the impulse that is driving us is just the inability to step back right now. And look at what's happening. Uh, we can't fit it into a larger pattern. We don't know where to where it's going. There's so much happening that sort of trying to look at a at something we can think of as parallel, at least in some way, allows us to then frame it in a bigger context. Well, if that frames into its larger context in this way, maybe our moment does in a similar way. I think that's exactly right. Um, I think that the you know the shock mm -hmm. at Trump's election was so profound that I think the immediate reaction was to go to mm -hmm. the 1930s. You know, what is the worst case scenario? Well, you know, mm -hmm. it's Hitler and Stalin and, you know, and Mussolini and Franco. And so immediately that's kind of where we jumped. But we're not in a moment where the United States or France or, or Germany is the Weimar Republic or the Spanish Republic of the, you know, the 20s and 30s. Um, these are old established states with rules that people generally have accepted for a long time. And Trump is not Franco. He's not Stalin. He's not Hitler. He's not, you know, that he doesn't sort of he doesn't equate to those figures and the context doesn't equate to those those contexts. Um, and I think what Rome allows us to do is a couple of things. I mean, first, it gives us a model of a republic that mm -hmm. is established, um, that comes under these kinds of stresses, specifically economic and the kind of um, stresses connected to demographic, rapid demographic changes. And what we can see with Rome is how something that is an established and functional and generally successful Republican form of government responds. And when it fails to respond, how long does it take and what does it look like? And I think we're really at this moment trying just to figure out even where we are. You know, are we at the beginning of a process? Are we at the end of a process? Are we at the, the sort of end of the beginning, which is kind of where I think we are? Um, and are there ways to pull out of this before we actually get to something catastrophic? And so I think that Rome is a great tool to think with. Uh, the United States, in many ways, um, the founders of the United States were deeply influenced by Polybius and by sort of their knowledge of the Roman Republic. And so there are sort of structural elements of the United States that evoke the kind of Roman, um, Roman models and Roman Republican models, at least as they were theorized. And... Uh, that I think means that there are some elements of sort of Roman Republican DNA that we share in our political structure. And so I think the Roman example is something that is, is quite useful for us to think with. Um, and I, and I, you know, emphasize to my students, especially, it doesn't mean that this is the outcome in the United States, but it means that this is a, a sort of set of processes and a set of tensions that we need to keep an eye on and we need to sort of be aware of and we need to be aware of possible outcomes when you have, say, political dysfunction in the way that we do right now. Yeah. And I would argue, and I think this is very true of, you know, when looking at Roman history as well, um, is that, you know, Trump didn't actually come out of nowhere. I, I think to understand Trump, you have to look back at least as far as Reagan. And this is one of the things about telling the, you know, the full story that you do is you see that that kind of chain of events that mm -hmm. that culminates with uh, Octavian. 
Yeah, I mean, I thought that uh, yeah. we could speak to that as why the particular time period. I mean, I could see why you end with Augustus. That's a fairly natural <laughs> end point. You know, it's a, it's a moment of, of complete <laughs> transition. It's sort of the end of that that process uh, yeah. and beginning of a new one. But why where you stayed, started in 280, I believe. So, you know, why that particular yeah. moment? What was the why did that seem like a good place to start the narrative? Um, I didn't want to go before the end of the conflict of the orders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what you have with the conflict of the orders is, you know, obviously a system that's at stress and, and undergoing stress for a long period of time, but a system that has mechanisms to sort of resolve that stress. And they're profound sort of, again, sort of freezing ups of the system. And then the system recalibrates. And after 287, the system recalibrates in a form um, that I think is, you know, more or less close to the final form that it will take in, in sort of resolving the questions of, you know, what is the position of a plebeian versus a patrician? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Pyrrhus comes like right after this, right. right? You have this sort of gumming up of the system, tremendous tension between different elements of Rome. Um, and then the arrival at a compromise in 287, that is, a, it's a significant compromise that, um, that, is a compromise mm -hmm. and people buy into it and there's consensus. Um, and I think going before 287 would require a whole lot of information that yeah. um, wasn't going to be integral to the narrative. But with Pyrrhus, what you have is, you know, a society that has come together um, and is now sort of still in the kind of afterglow of that consensus, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can build this kind of really surprising and kind of robust response to the threat that Pyrrhus poses, um, in large part because these are many of the same thought leaders who had pushed through, um, you know, the the resolution of the conflict of the orders. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I, I think probably a lot of people reading this, because I don't get into this this material. I don't get into the the two hundred years before mm -hmm. that um, because I didn't I didn't feel I didn't see a way to really do that and not lose the kind of narrative that I wanted to engage with. Um, but I think that there you know that it's potentially you know possible that people will read the discussion that I have of Pierce as somewhat naive. Um, I, I think that you know we're stuck with the sources we have. Mm -hmm. But I think seeing that moment as a moment of consensus is probably not, um, it's not at all a stretch. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Roman response to Pyrrhus is, is remarkable. It's surprising. And it, it doesn't come out of a society that has sort of deep-seated divisions that are unbridgeable. Right. Um, and so that's why I chose that as a starting point rather than I think the natural starting point perhaps would have been um, either the, per the first Punic War or Hannibal. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, I think with Hannibal, you're already too late. You know, I, I think in a sense in the 220s, you're already seeing some elements of divisions that, um, that people are willing to sort of exploit instead of sort of bridge. Right. Uh, and Hannibal sort of makes them paper these over. But I think in the 280s, those aren't there yet, mm -hmm. um, or at least they were there and they've been resolved and those people don't want to have that fight again. Yeah, and Pyrrhus kind of ends up being the successes against Pyrrhus. And for anyone listening who doesn't know who we're talking about, but the uh, and <laughs> it's a slightly complicated story, but basically a mercenary uh, force comes in and they end up in a big war. That's where we get Pyrrhic victories from. They won, but at great cost, The uh, great cost on both sides. I was in immense simplification of it. But anyway, I think you sort of see almost like a proof of concept. Uh, it's, I, I don't know, but you sort of wonder if they hadn't had those victories and, and that emergency against Pyrrhus, would that compromise have held as strongly as it did? But it, the immediate need to mobilize so many people and the ability to do so, and the good leadership that won them uh, in the end, the war, I guess sort of proved that this compromise they'd made worked and gave them a success yeah. um, in a way that sort of the Hannibal did too, except that it, with the ha with there was so many failures against Hannibal that seemed so clearly the product of problems with leadership and problems with debates between different parts of the Roman state that kind of exposes some of the right. strains in other ways. Yeah. And, and this is why I'm, you know, taking, I suppose, a credulous view of, of what goes on with mm -hmm. Pyrrhus. I mean, the situation with Pyrrhus is Pyrrhus comes into Southern Italy. He inflicts a serious defeat on the Romans. Um, 
And then he proposes peace treaty terms that are incredibly mm-hmm. mild, you know, just basically like I, you know, I will go away more or less if you sort of agree to this. And, you know, you don't really have to agree to very much. You just have to agree to this, the status quo ante. And uh, what the Romans basically say is we can't do that. You know, we, we can't accept this kind of even symbolic defeat. Um, we just can't accept that. And it's a tremendously sort of costly decision on one level because it's expensive, you know, to fight, continue fighting a campaign that you really don't need to fight. Uh, But on the other hand, I think that the same people who had led the sort of resolution of the the sort of social conflicts in the two, in the late, in the early 280s, in the late 280s are Mm -hmm. still there. Um, and and there is a sort of level of trust and I think a level of fatigue with political <laughs> conflict um, that allows them to say, look, we, ne- we need to bear this mm-hmm. cost. And that's something that, you know, that I think Republican systems are designed to do. They're designed to promote that. Um, and I think in the United States after World War II, you, you see something mm-hmm. similar, right? The, the, the same politicians that couldn't agree on anything in the late 20s and into the 30s um, and were really not interested in fighting wars and having foreign entanglements become very interested in that in the 40s. You know, there is a kind of consensus about international engagement that comes out of the war. It, in a sense, binds a generation of politicians towards a, a worldview that would have been incredibly controversial even 10 years before. Right. Mm-hmm. The Okay, so I think we've kind of... <laughs> Kind of adjust this already, but uh, just to make sure we talk about it a little more explicitly. So, what you talked about wanting to focus on the specific narrative, and I think you've brought out some of what that is. But what is, would you say, the central theme that you're trying to bring out? Because um, in many ways, you're telling a story, and this is not a criticism, but you're telling a story that's been told before. So, of course, you know it's not a a new story, but you are taking, and it's quite clear as you read it, um, you're highlighting particular elements of what's going on and coming back to the same sort of moves that are being repeated in different ways by different generations. So what what were the themes you you wanted to really highlight? One thing that I wanted to try to do was to make the Republic itself a character, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and to really speak about it as you know, metaphorically almost as, a, as an organism um, that, you know, that needs to be preserved. It needs to be sort of curated. It needs to be sort of cared for. And so the story of that, that institution or that entity, I think is important. And it's not something that we tend to focus on when we, we tell the history of the Republic. Um, I, I think that what we see with the later Republic is a, a structure, an institution or a political entity or w- whatever term we want to use for it, um, that starts out quite robust with a a very clear sort of mechanism for rewarding people who reward it and serve it um, and punishing those who put their own self-interests above the Republic. And by the end of the Republic, um, you know, as you move into the 40s, I think the crisis you see between Caesar and Pompey is that the Republic is not viable as an entity. Mm-hmm. It can't preserve Caesar or Pompey. You know, that conflict, even if it's resolved peacefully, the Republic can offer no guarantee to Caesar that he's not going to be brought up on charges. He's not going to lose his property. He's not going to be potentially even mm-hmm. killed. All of those things had happened in the past 15 years. And so I think that the the weakness of the Republic in the 40s was on some level, I think, perhaps surprising to people, you know, that, that Caesar, in essence, was left without legal mechanisms that could protect him if he decided to, to step back or he decided to kind of even f- find mm-hmm. a compromise. Uh, and I think that's the story that I wanted to tell, because I think that's the story that we are missing in our current climate. Um, you know, in the United States, there are people who speak up for... Democrats and and sort of policies and individuals and their people who speak up for Republicans and their policies and their individuals, but there are very few people who are speaking up for the Republic, right? You know, and, and saying that um, this is something that we need to preserve. It's something we need to protect, and there are norms and procedures that make sure it's robust and make sure it's strong. And anyone who violates those norms and procedures needs to be criticized. They need to be sort of reprimanded. They need to be potentially voted out. They even potentially even need to be charged for violating the law if they've done that. But everyone, regardless of any sort of policy disagreement whatsoever, should agree that the institutions of the Republic need to be protected. Mm -hmm. 
but I don't think we think that way. And I think what the Roman story shows is if you stop thinking that way and you just take for granted the Republic is always going to be there, it won't be there when you need it to be. Um, it wasn't there in the 40s in a meaningful way. And that led to the civil wars that were, you know, brutal and horrible and, you know, undid all of the sort of basic foundations of what, what Rome and the Roman sort of state was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that was the story that, that I hoped the narrative would bring out is, um, you know, that there are people involved in this, mm-hmm. but there's also a sort of institution that also has a sort of, in a way, lifespan that can be extended if you take care of it, but, you know, can end very sort of surprisingly if you take it for granted. And that, that sort of, you know, brings up for me something that I was wondering about, um, because, you know, where is exactly that tipping point? Where where do people not mm-hmm. stop protecting those institutions? I mean, at one point you say that the, the fall of the Republic wasn't necessarily inevitable, but I wonder, you know, if we consider from the standpoint of human nature, is it in a sense inevitable that people will begin to choose the short term over the long term when the circumstances reach a certain point, when they get bad enough, um, that it's sort of a, a natural human tendency to then not think of, you know, protecting those institutions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that... I think that there's a question of sort of basic optimism that I have, and maybe it's a fault. Um, you know, I look at the moment in, in 63 after the the sort of defeat of the Catalinarians, and you look at the coinage that comes out. You have this great coin from Emilius Paulus that it has Concordia on it. You have mm-hmm. Cicero talking about this sort of, you know, this like moment of great union where everybody has come together to talk about defending the Republic. And, you know, he's talking about this in like, like early December of 63. Um Six weeks later, no one is talking about that. It's already sort of descended back into division. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that there are these moments where people are like, yes, let's rally around, let's defend this. Um, But I think in a sense, what happens almost immediately after that is people sort of then step back and say, okay, everything's fine again. You know, now now we can go back to pursuing our own interests because the Republic is secure. And, Mm -hmm. And they move on. Is that inevitable? I would like to hope not. <laughs> um, I, I would like to hope. a certain uh, basic pessimism about human nature here that is not un- unlikely for him. <laughs> well, I, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, I think on some level it is um, maybe realistic. Um, <laughs> but I hope not. And, and I hope that what we can see with the Roman example is – when you do that, there is a consequence. Mm-hmm. I don't know that in 62, they knew that. You know, I, I don't know that in 62, a Roman who had just sort of survived the sort of Catalinarian con- the con- um, conspiracy, I don't know that they would say, yeah, wow, I mean, we barely sort of scraped by, but, you know, we're only going to last another half generation yeah. and then it's all going <laughs> to fall apart again. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think even in the 50s they saw that. You know, you go almost a year without elections and Pompey steps in and brings back elections and stabilizes things. And I think, again, pi- people probably wiped their brow and said, OK, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's coming back like we can we can still salvage this. The Republic will still be there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the lesson for us is. Maybe, but but also maybe not. And if we want there to still be a republic, there are things we need to do to protect it. Right. So what Rome is, um, going back to it, the earlier statement, is Rome is for us what Rome didn't have, because there had been no real model of that long li- long lasting a system that wasn't monarchical right. in some form, you know, monarchical, tyrannical, whatever, you know, individual based. I mean, there'd been oligarchies, there'd been this is and that's, but they didn't have a model. They were used to empires rising and falling. They saw that they knew that model of history. Right. But that's different than a constitutional system rising and falling. I mean, that's what right. Polybius is trying to to get his head around. He's seen these things rise and fall in a very sort of ongoing cycle, not a long lasting stability. So that's why he does his balanced constitution thing. Oh, aha, they found the secret to the, the to unlock the, the sort of solid state of, yeah. of constitution, something that um, can't fall apart. And of course, the 
the never ending irony of when he writes that and it's already <laughs> ongoing. Um, will never cease to vaguely amuse me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, you know, so, so we have Rome here to say to us, look, these things can, as you say, and, and I, I like that point you made about how looking back to the thirties is not the same because the thirties, uh, CE, <laughs> the yeah. 1930s, that is, <laughs> um, <laughs> because those republics were, you know, that was a time of ongoing cyclical revolutions. Things had been going in revolutionary cycles in a way, especially in Europe since the mid 1700s. Mm -hmm. um, none of those republics, none of those systems were really fixed. Only Britain right. had a had a sort of solid, uh, ongoing, stable system at the time. Yeah, I think that the, you know, I think that you put your finger on a couple things that are really important about where the Romans are in that last century. Um, the first is, I think they believe their PR, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, Polybius is a great example of this, right? Like you have something that's remarkably consistent. You don't understand why. So you theorize it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you're theorizing from a, a point that is actually a remarkably flawed point when you look mm -hmm. contextually about what's going on about or what's going on um, when Polybius is doing this. But, but, you know, on one level, Romans had this sort of idea that we are a stable state. Then on the other side, they don't know the end of the story. They don't yeah, know that the course. story could end. Um, and the same, you know, to, to move to where, you know, in a sense, I, I spend a lot of other time. This is the same story in the early fifth century. You look right. at some of the, the really dumb decisions made by Honorius and his court in the period between 408 and say 418. Um, they don't know that the ending they actually bring about is even possible. And how could they? It's been so long lasting. It's gone through so many crises, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How yeah. could they see that? How, they have no model for this falling apart. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, the late Republic is something similar, you know, mm -hmm. they, and they have sort of intellectual grounding to feel this as well. It's not just a suspicion, but it's a sort of, you know, it, it is almost sort of proving a theory that Rome is still around. And so there is a, there's a sense of, um, the inevitability of the sort of eternity of the Republic that I think brings about a complacency and also brings about a sort of willingness to put self-interest above the institutions that actually sort of sustain the state. And, you know, I, I think that the Roman example is useful for us to think with because we don't know the end of the story, but this is a possible ending of our story. Mm -hmm. um, and the Romans didn't have that as a possible ending. They didn't see it. They didn't know what to look for. And if we know what to look for, maybe we can at least be a little more aware of what we're doing. Um, and maybe there's a reason to be optimistic, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about is the, the role of sort of popularism and demagoguery, both in terms of the end of the Roman Republic and in terms of, you know, the world today. And it's a sort of fine line that doesn't have a, to my mind, a very easily established, uh, you know, border between trying to honestly represent popular opinion and egalitarianism and so forth, and then the sort of misuse of populism and how how it becomes demagoguery and and uh, and leads to autocracy in this yeah. weird, um, you know, paradox. Yeah, where what seems to be. What, what what presents itself as most popular mm -hmm. in a, a literal sense is often it, ends up with dictatorships. Yeah, I mean it's it's sort of yeah. stirring up a storm mm -hmm. to for uh, you know an alter, ulterior motive, but it's using the uh, the Mechanism. guise of popular opinion to uh, to win that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and this is actually I mean this is one of the things that um, I suppose my thinking changed the most you know, in, in this current context from, you know, where I had thought about these events for the past, you know, couple decades, um, and specifically with Tiberius Gracchus, you know, I, I've always sort of, um, been inclined to think positively about the objectives that Tiberius Gracchus was trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the policies that I think he was, you know, trying to put to bring about, um, I never thought about the methods that he used, you know, I had thought about deposing tribunes, but I never thought about the use of sort of implicit threat to get that stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that was that was really something where my feeling about Tiberius Gracchus in particular changed. 
Um, I think I still think that those policies they wouldn't have had much impact. You know, I, I think even if the land reform was fully done to the degree it was possible, I think the estimate is it probably would have affected at most like twenty five thousand families. Mm-hmm. So it, it wouldn't have solved any problem. It would have been you know a, a moderate solution that would have helped some people. But I think the idea behind it was, and the the idea of sort of finding new solutions to people who are disempowered is is good. But what Tiberius Gracchus did in terms of his methods, I think, was was profoundly dangerous because it opened a sort of new way of pursuing policy that was through threat and intimidation. And what he had were motivated supporters. Um, but when you move a generation later and you have Marius with armies or you have Saturninus with mobs, then it's the same model that Tiberius Gracchus is using, but the technology is better. <laughs> And I think the real danger with populism in the Roman context is populism of, say, Gaius Gracchus uh, is, I don't think, problematic. You know, he's not actually threatening no, things. He's just he's getting elected a lot. <laughs> yeah, he's an incredible orator. He has good ideas. He's pushing for, for solutions. And you can agree or disagree with the policies. Um, but the methods, I think, are not going to undermine the republic. They're not going to undermine the basic sort of idea that political discussion is something that should be done legally and through sort of representatives and magistrates and in a context that has a clearly defined set of um, rewards for winners and, and consequences for losers. And Gaius Gracchus was playing that game like it's supposed to be played. And his policies, you know, won out for a time and then started to not win out. But someone like Marius or someone like Gaius Gracchus or someone like Cinna, uh, I mean, Tiberius Gracchus or someone like Cinna, um, they're pursuing populist policies, but they're doing it with sort of menace and um, in some cases, actual violence. And that's something that to me is different. Um, I think when a demagogue is just using rhetoric and pursuing these ideas through a political process, the political process has a way of kind of distilling that into something that, if the the system is functional, um, can build around and build into a consensus that this is a good idea. And that's perfectly fine. You know, the system must be dynamic and it must be um, responsive to new needs as they arrive. Uh, And part of the Roman sort of problem in the second century is it wasn't dynamic enough before Tiberius Gracchus, Mm -hmm. you know, for the generation before him. Um, And I think populism done in that context, the system can accommodate that. But populism done in the way that, you know, Clodius did it or Marius did it or Saturninus did it, that's different and that's dangerous. Um, And that has nothing to do with policy. That is everything to do with, with mechanisms and the methods that are used. Um, and so I suppose that's that's how I would answer the question about populism. Mm-hmm. There's nothing inherently bad about it. Um, in some ways, if the system is functional, it is a way of basically bringing new ideas into the system to kind of be engaged with and ferment um, and come up with a solution that is a sort of compromise solution that a lot of people can be on board with. But forcing something through by threatening opponents or compelling um, people to support something that they haven't yet come around to support, that's profoundly dangerous because you're not using the political means. You're instead basically short-circuiting the system and using something totally different. Hmm. So that brings me to a thought that I've, I have I was having as I read uh, the book, and I've had it before when I think about Roman politics. And it's, I always, I can never decide whether I feel it as a, a sort of devil's advocate position or actually feel it. I, <laughs> I haven't really come to de- a decision on this. But so all the way through, um, and as you've been talking here through the book, and, and as you've been talking, you frame sort of political norms and constitutional norms and, and norms in general within the political system as essentially protective in, in as you were talking about, of the health of the republic, of the process of compromise. One of the things that I sort of wonder about is to what extent norms by their nature are protective of those already in power because they're established by and they have benefited the people who got to that particular position. And in Rome in particular, it's very uh, easy to sort of look at it and see how the the constitutional norms are benefiting, not necessarily individuals, but a group um, much more than another group. Yeah. You know, allowing and, you know, all of that happens with the orders, the conflict of the orders, but then it 
once it's settled down, we still have very much people who are, politi- are allowed to have political office, people who are not, people who are allowed to who hold land. As you said, um, Tiberius Gracchus's reforms, even if carried out, would have only touched a, a tiny amount of the problem of the of inequality and and sort of some people get something out of the Roman Republic and a whole lot of people, in particular the Italians, as becomes clear the next generation, don't. Yeah. Um, so how then, you talk about dynamism within the system, how then do we change a system that is oppressive or that is unfair without challenging those political norms? Because if, you know, compromise is good, but compromise is very slow and sometimes problems are much faster than that. Yeah. And also, how do we tell which norms are crucial and which ones are actually not? Because sometimes norms, you know, everybody, you know, like civility and discourse is one that comes up in various different ways right now. And I, I flip back and forth on that daily, essentially. Like, do we <laughs> need the norm of civility in order to be able to get anything done in any way that makes any sense? Or is civility just a, what, another way of saying, don't talk back know your place yeah you know and and depending on us especially because of how it's wielded you know norms are are wielded in all sorts of ways if tiberius hadn't used those mechanisms that he tried to use and everything had just stayed the way it was because he wouldn't have been able to get even what he did get done without it you know as you say that was the problem with the system at the time would that have taken them the republic down a better road there would have still been that rampant inequality. There would have been these, this, you know, widespread suffering and people who felt disenfranchised because they were literally disenfranchised. So, you know, like, this is the question. <laughs> I'm yeah. betraying a little bit of my radical um, socialist <laughs> revolutionary background here uh, in some political ways. But, you know, at what point is maybe not revolution, but like direct uh, engagement with changing norms necessary? And how do we tell? Is it just a matter of like, do I like the policies they're using or not? I mean, you've just said no. And I, I know you mean that and I understand what you mean. But yeah. you know, MLK went against civil norms. Um, Gandhi, environmental activists, lots of people break norms because those norms need to be broken. How do we yeah, balance I, that? So I think that there's a, a couple key questions there. And I, I want to get back to the question of norms, but I, I want to start with the idea of, of what the republic is. Um, a republic is not designed to be fair. And I think that's that's one of the sort of central stabilizing forces, but also one of the main vices of a republic. Right. Um, people's voices matter differently. You know, I, I live in California. My vote for president matters less than someone who lives in Wyoming. That's how it's set up. It's not fair. Um, and in a sense, um, the basic idea of a republic, when we engage with it, we have to think about, you know, what level of unfairness is tolerable and is the republic capable of becoming more fair? And I think what you see in these, in the Roman Republic is, um, there's considerable unfairness at the beginning of this. There's less unfairness as you go along, but there's always unfairness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what you see in the periods of sort of dynamic reform is there are conditions that are set to bring new groups in, but these groups that get a voice that matters are always elites, Mm -hmm. but there are larger and larger circles of elites. Um, And then in the 140s, you see a sort of set of processes that are agreed out politically that expands, um, you know, that that create secret ballots, um, Mm -hmm. that sort of create sort of mechanisms for voting that are more, you know, protected and less sort of transparent (laughs) um, in that they can't see how you're voting. Mm -hmm. And so there are reforms that are coming about in the 140s. Um, And then as you sort of move, you know, as you move through the later history of the Republic, what you see is there is an expansion of sort of access to higher office and franchise to larger sort of circles of people. It's never fair. You know, it's, it's never egalitarian. Um, the circles of people who participate at the highest levels are always elites. And that's true um, throughout. And, you know, is that ideal? No. You know, that's not how a republic should function. And the United States is a great example of a republic that does not function fairly. You know, the, the voices of certain people have always mattered more. And the voices of people in representative positions tend to almost always in the United States be elite voices. Mm -hmm. Um, The question is then about civility. Um, I grew up outside of New York. My concept of civility is very different (laughs) from the concept of civility in Canada. Um, 
it's still civil, right? Like if, if, if you're in New York and something goes wrong and you yell at somebody and, and you tell them explicitly that you're upset and this is why you're upset, in New York code, that's still civil. Right. Um, if you're in Indiana, it is not civil. You have not been civil at all. Mm-hmm. You've been hostile. You've been aggressive. And it, it will not be seen as something that's acceptable. Um, and so I think the question of, you know, what are the terms of civility that are appropriate to the moment? These are things that I think we can really we can really think about and struggle with. But I think that basically what a republic promises um, is ultimately that, uh, and I suppose what any political system promises is it, you will be able to behave politically and you will know the consequences for that political behavior. And in a Republican system, the consequences of the political behavior is in essence, um, if you win, your policy will probably be implemented in some way, but probably not exactly as you want it to be. And if you lose, you lose. And probably you maybe don't win the next election, um, but you won't be killed. You won't be imprisoned. You won't lose your property. And this was the basic deal that I think the Roman Republic more or less made. Um, And I think as long as political discussion takes place within a context where no one is going to lose their liberty, their property, or their lives, um, I think you're still in a context where that's civil discussion. Now, does that mean that you're yelling at people? Does it mean you're expressing strong feelings? I think absolutely. That's perfectly fine. Um, Does it mean that you're not serving Kellyanne Conway in your restaurant? Um, I think that's fine, <laughs> but it, but, but it's not okay to, um, club Kellyanne Conway outside of the restaurant. Right. Um, I can agree and, with and I think I that's, <laughs> I think that's the limit that we have to set. Mm-hmm. Um, I think radical action within the context of a political system is something that if that political system is healthy, um, it can dynamically adapt to that. If that position is something that needs to be taken seriously, that there's a a constituency for, it might take a while for that to filter up into a policy that can be implemented. But I think that it is possible that that policy can be implemented. And this was, I think, in in some level... um, the genius of Martin Luther King, you know, was recognizing a sort of mechanism that was political. You know, it wasn't violent. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that was a way to do things that were incredibly radical and affect change in a radical way. It didn't happen as fast as it should have. It didn't happen quickly, Um, but it happened. And it happened without the sort of widespread violence, you know, that could have accompanied the push for that change. And that's, you know, that's an incredible testament to somebody like Martin Luther King or somebody like Gandhi or even someone like Mandela who who can see that radical change is possible. It will take a long time, but there will be tension that will build up in a system that doesn't value everybody's voice equally. Um, But eventually, if that tension builds up enough, enough voices will need to be heard that representation will have to either adapt or disappear. You know, those people will either have to listen to those voices or either get voted out or basically make it so those voices don't matter anymore. And a healthy republic won't go the latter route. Right. Um, it will instead, I, I think, adapt eventually. And the genius of sort of Roman reformers in the 140s and early 130s was they did make it adapt. Mm-hmm. It was moving slowly. Um, but proposals like what Tiberius Gracchus proposed were floated in the 140s and blocked, but it was there. You know, the idea for it was there, the need for it was there. And um, had it not come from Tiberius Gracchus, but from somebody else, and had it come in a conventional way, it might actually have been implemented um, in a meaningful fashion without violence. Mm. It also might not have. But I think the the decision to move radically towards menace and threat and violence is dangerous. And it is, in a sense, I think, a pessimistic move, saying either you don't think the Republic is capable of responding or you're just uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable with the pace at which that response will come. Mm-hmm. Again, I think it, it it's maybe more of an optimistic take than a radical take. Mm-hmm. But I think you do have examples in, in a lot of these Republics that are you know fundamentally not equal. Um, and where voices are not equally heard, where still the the push for change is heard eventually. Of course, unfortunately, the way it sometimes works in practice is those attempts at nonviolent political 
mechanisms mechanisms do lead to violent pushback. I mean, dramatically in, in yeah. Martin Luther King, but also, I mean, if we think of the protester in Charlottesville who was killed, and then later have the president of the United States talk about you know the the people against her as being fine people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's right. that's a right. place where. Like that's in a way where you talk about that's not civility, according mm-hmm. to the definition you just gave, I guess. Even if the words are all polite, it's actually non-civility because it's condoning violence. Right, right. No, I think that that's, that's a step that is in a way contra, ca- counter to what a republic should be, right? Violence should not be part of it. Um, but I think also the, thing, the question will be, um, is Trump ultimately punished for that? He can't, in a sense, be punished in the conditions that the Republic set for that kind of conduct until 2020. And it, it, is he punished? And I think that will say a lot about the strength of where the United States is. You know, is is that kind of condoning of violent behavior something that Americans do step back and say, this is this is contrary to how our state should function. This is contrary to what our republic does. Um, and this is an example of us not sort of basically providing that basic security, that political activity um, should not result in physical harm. Mm-hmm. Um, and if Trump is not punished, then it says, you know, there is a there's a breakdown in that particular consensus. And that's worrying. But in a sense, the, the Republic in also sets the kind of the terms for how that punishment can be meted out by regular people. Right. And, um, you know, he, in essence, hasn't kind of come before that popular jury yet. And it will be telling to see where we are um, and, and what the response is to all of the kinds of things that he's condoned. But again, I mean, the, the if we make it to 2020, I think that those things are incredibly dangerous. <laughs> if we make it to 2020, Sorry, sure. Speaking of <laughs> given that we're recording this in the midst of the government shutdown week three, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I think we're two days from the record yeah. or something. I mean, I realize there's a big difference between government shutdown and like fall of the republic. I'm not trying to equate those two things. Just saying, speaking of norms being pushed, at least. This is pretty extreme. Yeah, I mean, and and I think, you know, if if you want to think again with something Roman, the sort of failures to hold elections that start Mm -hmm. happening in the 50s, well, initially it's, you know, a couple weeks and then eventually it's like, no, they don't hold them. In an entire year, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and that would have been horrifying even, you know, three years before people would have been appalled by the fact that Rome didn't hold elections for, you know, Mm -hmm. nearly an entire year. But once the sort of norm is broken... It's always open to be broken almost. Um, Mm -hmm. And the government shutdowns in the 90s, people thought this was insane. And now it just happens all the time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's it's Mm -hmm. almost unremarkable that this is, you know, that we, that the United States does this. It's just kind of par for how we behave now. And uh, that again is a remarkable erosion in norms. Mm -hmm. So is there any backtracking? I mean, once the damage has been done and a lot of damage is being done by Trump, you know, can you put the genie back in the bottle now? And not just Trump. Let's just, yeah, let's not just, just widen Trump. that but, one just but, a little bit. But yeah, but the, but you know, the whole the, mechanism The people right now. that he's, uh, you know, allowed to... Mm-hmm. Uh, the people who are enabling him and the people he enables. He, yeah. he enables, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the real, that's the real danger. You know, Romans were, were able to do this for moments. Romans were able after Sulla to basically mm-hmm. step back from the horror of all of this and kind of muddle through. I don't think anybody was, you know, they, they, in a sense, kind of just moved on. And uh, there's a horror in Pompey and in Crassus, and I think especially in Caesar, for what Sulla did um, that shaped the way they behave. I mean, I, I personally think that Sulla's conduct towards Caesar and members of his family um, helped influence Caesar to be as sort of willing to pardon adversaries as he was. Mm-hmm. There's there's a horror, I think, that that causes a retrenchment. And it's, I think, possible that Trump may be horrible enough that we step back. But the stepping back in Rome didn't actually solve the problem. It, in a sense, said that there, there are things that we are horrified to do, but that doesn't mean that we actually need to sort of double down and protect our republic. The post Sullen Republic was, you know, as, as Harriet Flower has shown, not stable at all. Mm-hmm. There was no there was a consensus that we should have a republic, but there was not really a consensus that the republic that Sulla set up is what we should have. 
and I, I think that that, um, that will be the real question is, is after Trump, what happens and, and how great is the damage? But I think as, as um, maybe Mark said earlier, this process started a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Gingrich behavior in the 90s, that was incredibly destructive to the basic norms of the American Republic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that set a lot of precedents for how things are happening now. And government shutdown is the best example, perhaps, but blocking nominees and, and a lot of the things that we've seen that are not Trump, not Trump, but, you know, just part of the general political climate that kind of helped help get us to Trump. Mm -hmm. Um, Those have roots that are are quite deep, you know, a generation ago, they were still doing, they were doing these things. Um, And and I think that's the, that's something that we see, you know, the Roman example says that these processes, if they unfold, there's sort of two steps, you know, there's responding to the individual, um, but then there's also responding to these kinds of conditions that, that are kind of unfolding that help sort of set the stage for an individual to kind of come up and behave in the way that some of these people do. Mm-hmm. I have uh, other questions about Rome, but I will say uh, one of the things that doing having this conversation really does is bring home for me I, in a way that I knew intellectually, but I've just not spent a lot of time thinking about how very different the Republican system is from a parliamentary system, <laughs> you know, and I know, you know, I, I know that I'm not saying anything people don't know, <laughs> but you know, there is yeah. this general, because of the the throwing around of the term re- democracy as, you know, the catchword of the West and all the rest of it, there's a term tendency to lump all of, you know, Canada, the UK, uh, the US in together as uh, in, in an opposition to autocracies and dictatorships and things like that. Yeah, that I forget sometimes. I mean, it is always brought home at every election cycle, which apparently is all the time now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, how there's there's so many things that are different between the way politics work in Canada and, and the U.S. But when you were talking about you know a republic being structurally unfair, uh, a republic being uh, not necessarily a republic has to be, but the republics are not necessarily built to be fair. Yeah. And I was recently listening to another podcast. Uh, it's actually um, Ancient Greece Declassified, and they had mm. he had an interview with someone talking about, and I didn't write down her name, and I apologize to her right now, about um, 18th century views of the ancient world, and in particular the founders of the U.S. And she was looking at early Revolutionary War um, views of the ancient world, and they were talking about how Rome was the model, of course, as we know, but how they essentially thought Athenian democracy was ludicrous and completely out to lunch and that anybody who threw themselves open to the mercy of the mob like that was just ridiculous. Yeah. And which, I mean, I kind of knew vaguely, but hadn't heard put, she was sort of quoting various of the, you know, authors of the Federalist Papers and things on, on these topics and, and putting it very clearly how much they just thought, no, no way, no, how are we doing anything like that? That's, that's democracy. That's not what we want. Yeah, you know, and not that a parliamentary system has any claim to being a direct democracy. It absolutely does not, and there's lots of structural inequalities built in too. But you know, listening to this and thinking about it really brings home to me how very different the systems are, even though on the surface they can seem quite similar. Yeah, well, I think in in a republican system that's functional, mm-hmm. that's true. Mm-hmm. In the United States right now, I think we're moving to a point where the parties are behaving like parliamentary parties, right. mm-hmm. you know, in parliamentary democracy. Mm-hmm. And um, they aren't compromising and they're using the tools that are supposed to sort of prevent this kind of thing from happening mm-hmm. to basically block any kind of discussion of ideas they don't like. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, you know, that's a real danger because in a parliamentary system, it, that's kind of the rule of the game. Yeah, you know that right? when you're you electing majority, people, you when, when, you're choosing, yeah. when you're choosing your representatives, you know that that's the power they're going to have. We also have more than two parties, which makes a big difference about how far anybody can go any one direction. Because there's, you know, yeah. things don't get just diametrically opposed necessarily. I mean, sometimes they end up that way. We do have two main parties, but we have other parties. And also you can, like, you can depose a leader at any point. You can call votes of no confidence. You know, like there are there are a whole bunch of mechanisms built into the process, not for compromise necessarily, but for putting a halt to it, saying, nope, stop. Right. <laughs> We're not doing this anymore. <laughs> we need to, we need to re- re- retry. We need a new, new election. Start again. Let's check that everybody's still on board with this. They're, that, you know, it's radical, but it's, it's 
within the norms of the system to do that. Yeah. And it's interesting when you you hear anecdotally about all of these people who, who voted for Republicans in 2016 to serve as a check on Hillary Clinton Yeah, without realizing what that actually was doing. Yeah. But I think the idea of sort of serving as a check is actually, I mean, I, I wish we would think of it differently. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not serving as a check. It's not stopping them. Mm-hmm. It should be moderating them. Right. Right. And it, it should be sort of pushing an agenda that's different to try to sort of encourage a conversation that moves forward that has sort of broad support. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and I think we've just sort of we've moved into this shorthand where we talk about our republic as a democracy. It, it's not. Right. And it's not fair like a democracy is supposed to be fair. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, recognizing that unfairness, I think, can promote a conversation about what those inequalities are right. and whether those inequalities are desirable. Right. Um, generally, they're not. <laughs> but um, but if you don't even acknowledge they're there, mm-hmm. you don't see that it's a feature of the system instead of kind of an accident, You know, then you aren't talking about, say, disenfranchising 1.4 million felons in Florida. Right. You, you just, you don't see that in a sense that dynamic sort of response needs to happen mm-hmm. because you don't actually imagine that, you know, you don't, you don't know your system for what it is. And you also sort of think about people who are f- serving as representatives in that system differently mm-hmm. um, without understanding what their actual function is supposed to be. You instead empower them to do things that are contrary to the interest of that system. Right. Anyway, I, I realize we've kind of strayed into uh, straight up current p- political discussion now. <laughs> but, you know, this, these are the things that are brought up. By, by And I thought it was really interesting how you do frame it at the beginning, in the very first chapter, you frame it as in this time of change and threats to republics around the world and, and such, uh, this story seems interesting to me. But then from then on, you never draw that parallel again in an explicit way, you know, and I think that was an interesting choice to not, or at least I don't feel like you do as you go through, you don't say, you don't, you, you don't say like Tiberius did this, which is the, like when Newt Gingrich, you know, refused to <laughs> let people, uh, appoint Senator, um, Supreme court justices or whatever, you know, you don't make those, um, contemporary parallels explicit. You allow people to sort of draw those conclusions. I wanted this to be a book that did justice to the Republic um, and and tried to do justice to the sort of the Roman story in a way Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, again, I I don't think that they're the same, but I think that the Roman story gives us tools to think with. And Mm -hmm. what I've found with my students especially is, you know, they they don't want a dogmatic interpretation of anything that happens in the past. But they want to know about the past so that they can sort of use it to think about what's going on around them. Yeah. But they don't want you to tell you what it, to, they don't want you to tell them what it means. You know, they want to know about it so they can think about it. Mm-hmm. And and I I felt very sort of I felt that it was doing the right thing um, to the material and and to the and for the readers to sort of just do my best to give them um, an account of what I thought was happening in Rome and the analogies that they saw would, I think, be, you know, be productive, Mm -hmm. but productive in whatever way they wanted to go with them. Obviously, you know, there are people who are a lot smarter than me who can, who can read this and see things that I wouldn't see. Um, And, and I don't want to sort of, I don't want to um, short circuit anyone else responding to this material um, by sort of imposing a modern interpretation on something that is, you know, it's not modern. Mm-hmm. It, it looks like it. It gives us some ways to think about modern conditions. But in me imposing a sort of explicit comparison, I think, prevents other people from making their own comparisons. Yeah, and that's that sort of made me think. Uh, you, you know, you talk a bit about this in the preface that part of the inspiration for this was from classroom experience with your students. Yeah, and that seems to me, uh, you know, a really important thing to for us to you know bring our teaching into our research mm-hmm. and and vice versa, and and also that that uh, the product of this was a book that is accessible to non specialists. So it is in a sense, uh, public facing scholarship. And, you know, these kinds of overlaps uh, seem to me uh, a really important job of academics today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that part of, um, you know, being in San Diego, being on the border, I mean, literally on the border, part of that is kind of, you know, seeing and having students who are experiencing a lot of the things that are major sources of controversy in the United States. 
and are just trying to get a fuller picture of just the world of the possible. You know, what are some ways they can think about what's going on around them and, and what sort of things are happening in the United States that affect them? Um, and I, I feel very profoundly that one of the things that I can do is to, you know, to just basically give them more information. Mm -hmm. Give them as much as as much sort of historical context as I can um, to show them that, you know, yeah, immigration problems are issues in Rome, too. You know, the question of who has legal status to be in a city, it's happening 2100 years ago, um, just like it's happening now. And some of the solutions that are being sort of bandied about now were tried in Rome and didn't work. You know, I, I think that part of the 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 obligation that I feel I have to my students is to to just give them information and encourage them to think critically about it and encourage them to respond to the past in a way that, you know, is maybe meaningful just on the terms of the past, uh, but also maybe meaningful in how they're thinking about things in a contemporary context. But, um, you know, but, but I think looking and thinking about what your students can do and giving them information to think with is a really important part of what we as academics ought to be trying to achieve. You know, they're capable of making their own decisions. They're capable of responding to things in ways that, you know, that uh, are very sophisticated and are very sort of nuanced, but they don't have the information usually. And part of our job, I think, is, you know, just to give them a bigger sense of the possible so that they can think through um, different outcomes and different choices in ways that are sort of meaningful and informed. And then to take that the step further of doing the same you know, to people who don't have the chance to be in your classroom, to right. be able to say, all right, I'm, this is information that's useful to my students. Why wouldn't it be useful to other people? Yeah. And, and I think that was that was why I was particularly happy to be able to, to sort of get this, um, you know, to get this out to a wider public. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I think that these, I think that the, the people who are interested in reading a a book about Roman history, um, they're interested in, in thinking about Rome, but they're also interested in, you know, opening their minds to what's possible in this world too. And mm -hmm. I, I think catalyzing or at least starting the process of, of having those conversations is, it's really important at a moment where I, th I think profoundly, you know, we're in a sense missing one of the things that we ought to really be thinking seriously about. Is this political system something that we value? And if so, are we willing to basically take steps that we will enable us to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a conversation in the United States that we, we need to have, frankly, not in sort of couched terms and not in sort of alarmist terms, but you know, in ways that are somewhat deliberative and informed. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to uh, stop on, a, some, on a, a sober but optimistic note, which I think is perhaps <laughs> appropriate to the uh, tone you take. <laughs> in the book and, and have, not in an alarmist or catastrophic, <laughs> catastrophizing way. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I recommend anyone who's been listening, who's interested in these topics to talk about it. Um, we, I, I guess one last thing I'll say is that uh, we have also spoken to um, Mike Duncan. I, I don't know if you know his, uh, the beginning, the storm before the storm, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. I know yeah. of it. He starts yeah. later than you do. He starts with the Gracchi. He does he does quite a just a directly narrative retelling. Really, the storm before the storm is mm -hmm. not that it's not analytical or intelligent, but it's it's just he takes narrative history and he does an in-depth narrative history. Really, he's doing the Marius and Sulla. That's what he's focusing on. He wants to focus on yeah. the first civil war. And he sees, like you were talking about, you know, you can't look at the fall of the Republic without looking back in a similar way, but it's a, it's a narrower and more narrative focus. Uh, but what's funny, what I really wanted to say was that in this, you know, using Rome to think with, he's on Twitter and he's always getting people send, asking him like, all right, so what Roman emperor is this guy like? Or what figure, you know, is he Marius or is he Sulla? Is he, you know, and it's, and he, he plays the game sometimes, but he talked to us on the podcast about how he, in more serious ways, really resists that um, analogizing of like, there's just one person who's exactly like this, you know, Trump is no single yeah. figure from Roman history. Um, that's not how it works. And and as I said, I, I, I think that's a strength of your book, as you say, that it it doesn't try to sort of force Roman history into a mold that will make it line up with what's happening in the US in any way, you know, for any side, for with any particular interpretation. It's lay, trying to lay it out as much as possible so that people can 
see the parallels where there are parallels, see the opposition where there's opposition, uh, see the different context that leads to similar results, which is, I think, one of the things that I find interesting. Uh, you know, in many ways, Rome is so mm-hmm. profoundly different from the U.S., you know, in all yeah. sorts of ways, not the least of which is things like slavery and things like women don't have the vote and, you know, like really profound right. differences. <laughs> Religious context is profoundly different, um, you know, things like that. And yet see that the, some of the results are similar, even though the context is so different. So I I, I like that, but it also makes me laugh to think about how, you know, that, that tendency to always want to be like, okay, all right, fine. Is he Nero or is he Caligula? <laughs> like, like, let's let's get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Which I think it's funny that people always want to turn to the empire for their parallels in some way. And yet the Republic, the late Republic seems so much more of a parallel. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, the shift in the historiography for the empire is personality-based and emperor-based, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like the, the condition of the age is the condition of the emperor yeah. and the virtue of the age is the virtue of the emperor. And so, you know, it's it's easy to make that equation because you, in a sense, have a caricature of an individual who mm-hmm. you can then sort of plunk down. Mm-hmm. But Cicero is complicated. Yeah. Cato is complicated. Pompey is complicated. Caesar's complicated. There's There's no... There's no one reading for them, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I think that's the challenge with the Republic is you can't <laughs> you can't easily say on Twitter, like, who who is he like um, with an emperor? You mm-hmm. could because you have a caricature of who like who's Commodus. Well, you know, he renames the city after himself and he shoots an ostrich in the arena and <laughs> that's Commodus. Um, yeah. And, you know, and you really have to dig to get at the complexity of some of those figures. I mean, my favorite one to dig at is Domitian, because uh-huh. I, I think you can actually get quite a bit there. But, but yeah, you have these caricatures, and it's easy to make equations when the character, when the people you're equating with are uncomplicated, mm-hmm. because you're basically attributing a virtue right. or a right. vice to somebody. And the Republic, you know, these guys, it's really hard to sort of pin them down as one thing or another. Mm-hmm. They're very complicated. And we almost know too much about them. To be able to do that too, some yeah, of them, some yeah. Ways. We know too many. Yeah. We know how too much of the tra- trajectory of their career, how many different sides they took on similar issues. You know, all these sorts of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're just they're complicated humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're not cartoons. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, so the book, just to make sure we plug it properly, "Mortal Republic: How Rome <laughs> Fell into Tyranny," um, and it's available where all. Uh, I'll find booksellers. Um, and I'll put a link in our show notes, of course, to it. I'll also put a link to your bio, if that's all right, just so p- people can see your other books, because yeah. they all sound fascinating. I don't know to what extent those are more sort of publicly accessible books or works of more with a more scholarly audience, your previous ones. Um, Final Pagan Generation is is written to be publicly accessible. Right. And Hypatia to a degree is as well. So I'll make sure that people can see uh, those as well, because I think uh, the final Pagan Generation sounds very interesting, and I'm not going to get us started on another (laughs) tangent now. But uh, I'll leave that as a teaser. We can talk about that sometime. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) I'll leave that as a teaser for now. People should follow up on it. Um, (laughs) But uh, And you're not on Twitter, are you? Uh, no, I yeah. watch. Okay, no, that's all right. I just, I would give you, you know, your contact details if the, if you were, but I'll leave you, <laughs> I'll leave you to lurk. <laughs> uh, that's well put. <laughs> I think that's a fine position to take, frankly. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, so thank you very much. Thank you. And oh, this is so much fun. Thank what? you so much for making the time. Oh, uh, the same to you. <laughs> you can go back to sunny, foggy La Jolla. <laughs> we'll go back. Yeah, to- the fog. The fog is burning off, so it will... Well, you have a fine day ahead of you. Whereas I think the snow's been falling all day, so I probably have to shovel when I go out to the car <laughs> again. Uh, well, hopefully you don't have another snow day. <laughs> no, that would be good. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. 
keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favourite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.